this time I'd like to uh, introduce a longtime resident of the Westport Western area, a name that you all know, uh, Harry Reasoner. kind of thing, and I understand it's because you drank too much before I got here. <laughs> I've been in touch with Father Looney, and he says he cannot cut his benediction. <laughs> so uh, I have agreed to cut my speech by eliminating the question period, because I don't have any answers anyhow. I am glad there's something particularly scritchy about making a speech in your own hometown. Uh, some of it is nice, you see friendly and familiar faces out in the audience, and your wife has to listen to the speech again. And, but you also see people like your banker. I was, uh, I was touched to see Mr. Stone stand up because he and I have been through a lot together. One day. <laughs> I dropped in yesterday afternoon and for the first time in 17 years, I think I paid a loan instead of making one. If he can sweat it out for 50 years, I guess the rest of us can. We are late, and I, I do sometimes wonder even out in what we call the hinterlands in Westport, where I make most of my speeches, I sometimes wonder where they have something called a, a guest speaker, and what it adds to an occasion like this. Uh, I say even in Iowa. I don't know anything you don't know, and that's certainly more true than ever in Westport. I say things like, I don't have any wisdom from the East, and certainly that's true here. <laughs> and I suppose it's just the kind of general concern we all feel, even here, even in this most sophisticated town, the general concern we feel as Americans about what's going on in the country, which we've been brooding about since last November 7th, Well, that's what I mean by a sophisticated audience. <laughs> okay. we, uh, we have been living with a most puzzling and typical American decision in this country since last November. We had an election in which uh, Richard Nixon won the presidency by the largest popular vote margin in history. 61.3%, we figured. There were demands for a recount on that, but Mr. Johnson unfortunately went to join the great majority. Uh, he had been something like 61.2%. But it certainly was a tremendously large landslide and an apparent clear statement by the American people. At the same time, while giving Mr. Nixon, the largest percentage of the people who voted in history, they also gave him the smallest percentage of people eligible to vote since 1948. Only 55% of the people who could vote met, bothered to go out, and only 61.3% of those voted for him. It was, was an apparent ringing endorsement of Richard Nixon. But it had nothing to go with it of what we call in the journalistic cliché, nothing to go with it of coop tales. Uh, nobody else went in with him. We've had four landslides in the century in presidential elections, if you call a landslide for a convenient benchmark, a case where the winner gets 60 percent or more of the vote. In 1920, uh, Warren Harding won with 60 percent. And he carried in a, a gain of 11 Republican senators and 63 Republican House members. In 1936, which was Mr. Roosevelt's biggest year, even though he already had an overwhelming Democratic Congress, he carried in six senators and 11 new House members. In 1964, where again Lyndon Johnson already had a very solid Democratic Congress, he carried in two senators and 38 members in the House. But in the fourth landslide of the century, the Republicans gained only 
slightly less than you would expect in the normal election change in the House, and they lost two Senate seats and a governorship. Now, part of that may have been that during the campaign, Mr. Nixon, if you remember, did not particularly campaign as a Republican. He never mentioned political parties. He was nonpartisan. He was talking about the new American majority. It was hard to tell what party he belonged to. At the time, there was a good deal of resentment about it. Uh, National Republican Chairman Robert Dole mentioned it on election night. In the last few months, there haven't been as many Republicans complaining that Mr. Nixon uh, refused to identify himself with the party. But uh, that may have been part of it. There are a lot of reasons. When you try to read the American people and what they mean and what they think, you get into a lot of confusing things. Uh, you think about youth, for example. We've got some youth in Westport. They, uh, who had talked so much about how they were going to change the world and change the country in 1968, were mostly doing something else in 1972. You have the undoubted fact that we didn't have in 1972 the two most charismatic candidates in history. Uh, I remember Art Buckwald said shortly before the election that it seemed to him that Richard Nixon still looked like the man from whom you would not buy a used car, and George McGovern looked like the man who bought it. Uh, I got very fond in the, in the months of the campaign, I got very fond of John Smiths, who was running on the loose organization of parties that, that George Wallace had left behind, not on an ideological basis, but I liked his, his sense of humor. And he advised people to vote for him because he said he was the only viable alternative. He said the only other choice was to vote for Richard Nixon, who had broken every campaign promise he ever made, or George McGovern, whom you hoped to God would break every campaign promise he ever made. <laughs> well, we had this something less than dramatic campaign, and it came out the way it came out. I misread it. I was surprised. I didn't, uh, I didn't think after, probably after June, certainly after July, I didn't think that uh, the Democrats could win, but I certainly didn't foresee the kind of decision we got. And I think I misread it because I was thinking of the 1970 elections when Americans, in a more traditional way, voted on an economic pattern. We had troubles then, we had job troubles, we had wage earner troubles, we had interest troubles. And in 1970, you had a situation where places like South Dakota and Nebraska went Democratic and Tennessee went Republican. And it seemed to me that that would probably prevail right through 1972 and that the tremendous economic problems that faced the country would bring down Mr. Nixon since he had not been able to really to solve them. Well, what we didn't foresee was the very dramatic foreign policy initiatives by the president. We certainly didn't foresee what he did, for instance, in going to China. I remember uh, two years ago, Mrs. Reasoner and I were in Ireland, and we had been out visiting the holy places in Dublin, and we got home about 3 a.m. They keep up. <laughs> They keep the holy places in Dublin open late. <laughs> and we, our, our host had been the director of Irish Television News. And at 9 o'clock the next morning, he called me and said, uh, would you mind coming down and being interviewed? Uh, President Nixon is going to China. And I said, come on, Mike. You know, it's a, it was enough fun and games last night. <laughs> but it turned out to be true, and I... I did go down and I was interviewed and he said, what do you think this means? And I said it could mean one thing and it could mean another. And when, when I got back to New York, I was glad to see that's what all the other experts were saying. So, <laughs> but it, that kind of thing, very real advance by this president, I think had a substantial effect on the election as well as a number of strange things that the Democrats did and a number of mistakes they made, which I'm sure they won't make again. But in any event, we did have a landslide, a much clearer verdict than we had had four years before in 1968. 
which you'll, for, you'll remember was not a vintage year, this time, in 1972, the decision, if puzzling, was very clear. The United States decided in November that they wanted Richard Nixon to have a mandate, and they didn't want him to do anything with it. Well, he had had different ideas for some time, we keep learning, as to what he intended to do. But what we got, and what we have to live with as Americans, and as participants in the democracy, whether we like it or not, is the fact that we have returned to a consensus in this country. It's a negative consensus, but it is a consensus. And that overall is a good thing. We've always lived by consensus here. We have always had a great many more people in the middle than we have had on either side. I was glad to hear tonight an explanation of how people might lean to the left. And I <laughs> hope that it be forwarded to Vice President Agnew. That, uh, uh, I don't run around the gym every day, but if I do lean slightly to the left, I'm glad to have an excuse. <laughs> but it was a consensus, and the figures show it, because the most striking feature of what happened last November was its uniformity. When you have a situation where less than 10% separate places like New York, which voted for Mr. Nixon by 59 percent, and Virginia, which voted by 69 percent, Arizona was 67 percent, Montana was 60, Texas was 66. You really do have a consensus. Those are very different parts of the country. Now, we haven't had that recently. In the last landslide, when Mr. Johnson beat Senator Goldwater, it was an overwhelming majority, but it was not a consensus. The places that split away, split away almost as if you had cut them out with a knife. The five states of the Deep South and the other areas of the country that went for him. But not now. What we, have, what we had last November, before we got into our present pickle, what we had was as near to a national conclusion in this pluralistic nation as we have had since 1936. And there's always a danger with that. My colleague Howard K. Smith spoke in the morning of election night, the morning after election night, when it became clear that the dimensions of this victory were perhaps the greatest in history. And he said he always worried about a man with a landslide like that. Because again, if you look back to the three previous landslides in this century, the first was war on Harding whose administration was widely tainted, although with an old-fashioned kind of villainy. The second was Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. He believed then that he could go ahead with a drastic revision of something very dear to the American ethic, the Supreme Court, and went to disaster. And the third was Lyndon Johnson, who after his victory in 1964, unwittingly led us into Vietnam. And Howard said on that morning of November 8th, I sincerely hope and I wonder what will happen to Richard Nixon. I have recently said to Howard that whenever he speaks off the cuff like that, I am going to listen. We did have it. We had the negative conclusion. Some things since are very clear. I think the country, if not Westport, the country as a whole had a very strong misperception of George McGovern. I think we saw the end, probably forever, what has come to be known as the old Roosevelt coalition of the blacks and the unions and the South and the liberals, a bunch of very strange but uh, many voted lip, uh, bedfellows. I keep coming back to the failure of youth to live up to its responsibilities and its yappings. Not much happened with them. And I think most of all, we had a weariness of the American electorate with drama. We've been through a lot of drama in the, few, in the last 25 years. And I think where people were tired of it. They came into a massive agreement that we wanted to slow down and see what we were doing. But massive agreement, as we all know, even in town affairs, massive agreement doesn't necessarily mean solutions. I think it's probably useful to spend a couple of minutes thinking about where we are in America in 1973. I think we're ending 
the longest period of loud introspection that any country has ever gone through, following a kind of a binge that we went through after World War II. Since 1963, at the end of that binge, we have been questioning all kinds of things, realizing that all sorts of American principles and assumptions are in doubt. Principles such as the, the solution to what we need is the idea of infinite growth in a world that we have found is all too finite. Uh, principles such as that if you can identify a problem, of course you can find the wealth to solve it. I looked up at a couple of those old headlines on the slide presentation in 1923, and I was surprised to see that even then it said uh, town committee to attack garbage problem. Uh, I know that was the first headline I saw in 1956 when we moved there, and I think it was the headline I saw last week. Anyhow, the idea that we can't solve all problems, the idea that in a military sense that we have the infinite strength to guide the world. And we have the infinite strength and we found the world doesn't, to be, doesn't want to be guided. We've come a long way just in my lifetime, which is roughly coincidental with the lifetime of the Westport YMCA. I remember in 1939 when I was a senior in high school reading articles saying that the United States was in a situation of a static economy. We were 130 million people then. The uh, economists said we might very well go up to 150 million people, and then we would sag back to about 135 million, and we had to learn to live with that. We went from that, which all of the experts were sure was going to happen, we went from that to the idea that in the 1950s, after the euphoria of World War II, that we would go on growing forever and that we could continue selling each other things and building houses and messing up things all the way through and continue to make more and more of our children wealthy and give them the same kind of values that we had had. It didn't occur to us that they didn't want them. And then we went from that again in the 60s, to the great period of disillusionment, both in foreign affairs, where for a, a long time nothing seemed to go right except for Israel, and to disillusionment at home, when all of our values were questioned, when our youth was alienated, when our conservatives believed we were just completely wrecking the country, when for a period of time even the Reader's Digest occasionally published a pessimistic article. <laughs> We've come from that to the 1970s, when we are looking for our heritage. And the national consensus was to slow down without realizing that that doesn't solve the problems. Mr. Nixon faced in November the fact that winning elections don't end anything except for the losers. The losers go off on vacation to the Virgin Islands. The winners have to deal with the problems. He wanted a calmer, less permissive, a stricter United States. I think he might have gotten it. An awful lot of people, including people like myself who would in general be characterized as liberals, had a great deal of sympathy with some of the things he wanted to do domestically and some of the things he was doing in foreign policy. That, as you all know now, seems to be down the creek for reasons that we don't completely understand and for responsibilities that we cannot yet completely assign, but gone. But that's what he wanted. But he already had enough problems, even if this disaster hadn't come on him. This man, the fiscal conservative, and I'm a fiscal conservative, Mr. Stone, I'd like you to remember that. <laughs> this man, the fiscal conservative who brought Arthur Burns to Washington, had, a, had achieved in four years the greatest deficit of any administration in history. He was unable to get unemployment below five million. He had applied all the classic and sometimes rather vicious uh, economic elements to solve inflation, and the problem was not that he didn't apply them, but was that they didn't work. He assembled before the last, uh, happy word of the last month, he had assembled about five in a row of the worst quarters of the U.S. trade deficit in history. He had achieved no real improvement in American productivity. He'd made some progress abroad, 
He did end four years late, but he ended the war in Vietnam. But he had not done much about the scars that Vietnam left in the United States. He had been able to do nothing, and no one, neither had anyone else, about the Middle East, which is a more terrifying situation, really, than Vietnam. And he was faced with a, even before Watergate, faced with a hostile Congress and the fact that he was a lame duck president and faced some challenges to the control of his own party since he could not run in 1976 unless the 23rd Amendment was repealed, which now seems unlikely. So, facing all this, I don't think the United States intended to make a lot of final decisions last November. I don't think they have expected to find what they have found since. I don't know what the President thinks. I thought we might be, I might have a problem today because he was speaking in public for the first time in two months to a college graduating class in Florida. And I thought that he might finally tell us how things were and I might have to stay in town and say something about it as I did about his trip to China. That is that it might mean one thing and might mean another. <laughs> but what he said was that everything's all right. Uh, I think, in a way, the government has been talking to itself. And it's too bad, because at this moment, history is very much calling for America's attention. In the last year of Richard Nixon's second term, or in 1976, whichever comes later, at the end of this four years, in which we worry and attack the problems that we've got, this country will be 200 years old, which is not old as nations go. It's old as people go, and it's old as YMCA's go, but not old as nations go. But it is and has been for some time the second oldest major continuing government in the world. And not many governments and not many nations live that long, and practically none live any longer. This is where I am fascinated to see a gathering like this. People willing on a warm night in a town where people don't get enough to spend time with their families and enough time at home. I'm fascinated to see people willing to come out for some kind of community endeavor. Because this is where the responsibility touches us all, no matter who we are. Where it touches American business, which has realized that it has to take the long view, or there isn't going to be any short view, such as the American military and our old combative spirit, which has seen the limitations of strength in solving America's and the world's problems. I wonder what kind of a birthday we're going to have. I've seen a good deal of Americans in a good many situations, which is the only advantage a journalist has over any intelligent man is that you get paid to look at people and see what they're doing. And I like them. I think they're strong. I think they're fine. I think the illness of spirit is coming to a final solution. We reached a kind of a climax and kind of a decision in the Nixon landslide last fall. Seems to me the country said, no thanks, Senator McGovern. We don't want, at the moment, any more clarion calls to follow a banner that we can't quite read. It said to the new left, no, wait, we don't want that either. Wait and meld into what we've got in the way that the left always has. Don't bomb into it. And it said to the old right, no, we aren't willing to go back to that either. It said the middle is speaking, the middle is taking over. Well, the trouble is, what is the middle? Well, the middle is very particularly America. As the President said, the things that have happened in the last three months show the vitality of the middle in this system. The system did work. All it has done so far is rip everything up, but it worked. It was stronger than the landslide. What we have to do now, if we are the middle, and I suspect we all are, we have to react. We have to pray for a White House that works. We have to pray that the middle, which won the victory, will now assume the responsibility. 
I think it's fair enough to say in a place like this, on a night like this, who we are. We are the bourgeoisie. We are the largest middle class in the history of the world. And people make fun of the middle class a lot of times and the bourgeoisie. But our system, the system that we've lived under for 200 years, made this class. It made in the process the Babbitts and the Snopeses and the E. Howard Hunts. But it also made the Lindberghs and the A. Philip Randolphs and the Neil Armstrongs and the Jonas Salks. Was to see if this system, which produced so many of us, now 200 years old and sore beset, is as good as most of us believe it is. Well, I'd like to think that we can prove it in spite of the clowns and the crooks and the weariness. And I'd like to say in conclusion that this is not only the 50th year of the Westport YMCA, it's my 50th year, and I'm touched and proud that we come together at the same time. I am willing to commit myself to come back for the hundredth year. <laughs> some, of us, uh, some of us have noted that uh, out of YMCA, which originally meant Young Men's Christian Association, is not mentioned anymore, that uh, of the four names, only one survives. Now, the three that have disappeared, Young, Men's, and Christians, I would really object to the disappearance only of Men's. Uh, but I would delight in the fact that association survives and way survives. I think this kind of a gathering, this kind of community spirit, is the only hope we have, and I hope you keep it going. I thank you very much for inviting me here tonight.